this is actually quite a long talk, so uh, I'll try and just get through it. Um, just raise your hand if you've ever used terrible conference or hotel or airport or even airplane Wi-Fi before. Okay, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Um, if you've ever frantically tried to find the address for a meeting or a restaurant as you dive into the back of a cab or get onto the subway or the underground, anyone tried to do that before? Hands up if you've done that. Um, if you or anybody you know has got a pay-as-you-go phone contract where you pay for the data as you use it, raise your hand. Most people, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Um, anybody um, used a really expensive data roaming contract when they've been abroad? Like right now, I've got a really expensive, really restrictive data roaming plan. Okay, so anybody who miraculously didn't put their hand up through any of that, um, look around you. You are kind of the exception rather than the rule. Nearly everyone in this room has suffered diminished performance experiences that were not their fault whatsoever. So I'm Harry and I'm here to talk about why fast matters. Uh, I'm a consultant developer from the north of England. Um, I spend a lot of my time working with clients, typically fairly large clients, helping them make more scalable and much faster websites. Uh, clients are a little like these, so performance is big money to a lot of people. Um, one of the clients on this slide is a company called Trainline. Trainline published some information a couple of years ago uh, in which they found out that if they reduced latency by just 0.3 seconds, customers would spend an extra 8.1 million pounds every year. 0.3 seconds was worth 8 million pounds to this company. I'm actually consulting with the Trainline on this body of work and it's fascinating stuff. It's uh, very insightful. And the good news is it's really easy to make a website 0.3 seconds faster. Um, Netflix. Netflix saw a 43% reduction in their bandwidth bill just by turning on GZIP. My first question is why was GZIP turned off in the first place? That's just, that's just stupid. But turning GZIP on, just a simple, tiny, performance-related config change, save Netflix 43% of a bandwidth bill. Imagine saving that much money at Netflix's scale. And most of the stuff they're serving can't be Jesus anyway. So this is huge, huge numbers. We're talking massive savings here. Uh, GQ, the lifestyle magazine, they cut, uh, sorry, they cut load times by a very impressive 80%, and in exchange, they saw traffic increase by 80%. And after that increase in traffic, Users hung around for 32% longer, which meant that kind of page views increased. So even if you're not directly an e-commerce company, if you're not directly selling to end users, uh, performance can help you increase uh, engagement, brand awareness. And ultimately then, I hate to mention it, but if you are running ads on your site, getting a 32% increase in impressions, that's going to affect the bank balance. Um, all of these case studies were grabbed from a site called WPOstats.com. It's definitely worth checking out. If anyone's ever struggled to sell performance to a client or to a manager, which is most of us, uh, WPO Stats is an amazing resource. It's just full of different case studies, uh, reports, and write-ups. There's a reason I picked those three specific case studies, though. The reason I picked those three for this talk, firstly, uh, the train line case study told us that Performance helps make money. It will make you more cash. The Netflix case study showed us that it actually saves you money. Taking performance into account will save your overheads. It will lower your overheads. I've worked with several clients where speeding up their website has actually reduced their bills significantly. The latest client, we managed to reduce their throughput by 62% just by making it faster. And finally, we all know this one. Faster websites mean happier users. Nobody enjoys using a slow website. One thing, though, about all of these case studies, and most of the case studies we look at when it comes to web performance, is they're all financial. Um, but I don't want to talk about finance through this talk. It's a very capitalist view of building fast websites is that it will make us more money. But there's a different kind of side of things. that It, it strikes ethics and uh, morality a little more. And that's what I want to focus on um, in this talk. There are a few stories I want to share with you. One important thing about all three of these stories is they happened this year. They happened in 2017. I'm not talking about the internet five years ago. I'm talking about the last few months. 
Uh, the first story, a friend of mine, he needed, to send, he needed to reply to an email. I'd sent quite an important email, and uh, he just didn't respond for a couple of weeks, and it was getting a bit stressful because I needed a reply. So I actually ended up going to where he worked. <laughs> sounds very stalkery of me, but I went to where he worked, and I was like, dude, you didn't reply to my email. He was like, oh, I'm really sorry. I was actually on holiday in Thailand, and the, the connectivity in Thailand is so bad that I could see the notification. I could see that I'd got an email, but I was unable to open it. I just couldn't read it because the connectivity out there was so bad. The next thing, um, this is quite a long one, so I will have to read this one from my slides, but someone sent me an email uh, towards the beginning of the year asking for some advice. It happens quite often. People email me asking for advice on development, and um, he didn't reply for ages, and I was like, eh, that's kind of rude, but I forgot about it. Two weeks later, he did reply, and he said, look, I'm really sorry for the delayed response. I'm on a really bad connection. And me being a performance engineer, I just said to him, tell me everything you can about bad connection. What does bad connection mean? And he said, I'm currently at my parents' place in Rajasthan, which is northern India. Uh, since my parents don't have a computer, they only consume internet through their smartphone. We rely on internet services by telecom providers, which in our town are still 2G. Some providers claim to be 3G, but I have never seen it working. So right now, I've connected my laptop via Wi-Fi hotspot. Opening Gmail in the basic HTML version takes between 30 and 60 seconds. And most of the websites, I just use my mobile phone anyway. I don't actually use my laptop because you know, uh, it seems like Chrome makes optimizations for mobile users. So there's two really interesting things here. One, I've only ever had to open the basic HTML version of Gmail once, maybe twice in my life. You know, I'm so rarely on a connection that bad that I even need to do that in the first place. This guy has to do it every time, and it still takes one minute to load. And the second thing I want you to think about is when you go home, you've probably got a router in the corner of your room, and it's a nice, fast connection. It gets you online. This guy's family don't have a router. They've got a commodity Android device. Their router is actually a 2G connection, high latency, low bandwidth, and that's how they permanently access the internet. Their entry point to the web is very, very different than what we are used to toward the West. The third little story, and by far my favorite, is um, I got a direct message from someone, again, asking for development advice. And um, just coincidentally, about a month earlier, I'd been looking through my Google Analytics, and Analytics told me that Nepal was a particularly uh, sorry, problematic area for me. And Nepal was uh, a, a part of the world where users suffer slow load times on my site. So I asked him, hey, look, whilst I have your attention, is my site slow for you? He replied saying, no, I don't think so. I click through, and it loads within a minute. Imagine that not feeling slow. If we went to a website, and it took a minute to load. We'd assume it was broken. We'd assume it was down. We would go elsewhere. For this person, it wasn't slow. Oh, no, it's quite fast. It loads within a minute. That's the first thing I want you to think about, is the fact that a minute is fast. The second thing is, my site, by design, is a very fast website. I'm a, I'm a performance engineer. I have a fast website. I was checking some statistics just yesterday, and 77% of people who visit my website um, have fully loaded have a fully loaded page in under three seconds. So what does that tell me? It tells me like maybe the people visiting my site statistically are more likely to have fast connections, but definitely there are people visiting my site from parts of the world where they don't get sub three second load times; they get sub one minute load times. There's a really interesting thing that all these stories have in common, and you may have noticed it already, but all three of these things happened in the East. None of these are Westerners. None of these are Western stories. All of this stuff happened in Thailand, India, or Nepal. The state of the internet in that part of the world is very, very different than what we're used to. There's a project called the Next Billion Users. Who's heard of this? Okay, a few of us. The Next Billion Users is a project spearheaded by Google which aims to help emerging markets get online. If you just Google Next Billion Users, you'll probably find this website by Quartz. Uh, it's a really good canonical resource, and it tells you a lot about the state of the internet in emerging economies. You may have seen this diagram before. Uh, more people live inside of the highlighted area than outside of it. Even taking into account how much ocean is under that blob, more people live inside that area than outside of it. When you notice that this takes into account places like India, Indonesia, China, Bangladesh, you know, very densely populated countries, it's quite quick to see that, oh, right, well, that's why you know, there are so many people there. 
very, very densely populated areas. I just want to go through some statistics about some of the countries in this part of the world. There's a lot of feedback on this mic. I feel like it's going to be really annoying for you all listening to me breathing. Okay, so if we go and look at Bangladesh, the average connection speed is at three and a half meg. Uh, only 15% of Bangladeshis are online. Uh, with 3.9 million broadband subscriptions, only 2.4% of the population actually have what we would consider a dedicated fast connection. With 134 million cellular subscriptions, that represents a staggering 83% of the population who can get online via a cellular network. 34 times more people in Bangladesh get online with a cellular, high latency, low bandwidth connection than they do with broadband. If we move over to India, three and a half meg connection, a quarter of Indians are online. Um, with 17.1 million broadband subscriptions, only 1.3% of the population have what we would consider a dedicated connection. With a billion, and that's not a typo, that is a B, with one billion cellular subscriptions, 79% of the population get online with a mobile device. That means that 58 times more Indians get online via a cellular connection than they do with a dedicated fast broadband connection. Moving over to Pakistan, uh, the average connection there is only two and a half meg. 20% of the population are online, roughly. 1.8 million broadband subscribers represents just 1% of the population on a fast network. And with 126 million cellular subscribers, we've got 67% of the population on a slow network. That's 70 times more mobile users. These numbers are only getting bigger. Uh, I know it's lots of people taking pictures of these slides. They're online already, so you can grab them all at the end. Um, so in Pakistan, 70 times more people are on a high latency, low bandwidth network. Indonesia is the really interesting one. Um, with a 4.5 meg average connection, it is the fastest region out of the, uh, out of the group. Uh, a fifth of people are online with just 2.8 million of them uh, having broadband, 1.1% of the population. This is where things get interesting. With 338 million cellular uh, uh, sort of subscriptions, that represents 132% of the people getting online with a mobile device. What this tells you is that people, on average, have more than one device. They might have, well, I guess 1.3 phones each. Now, Southeast Asia is the fastest growing economy in the world, and Indonesia is its fastest growing country, so maybe that explains the sort of tendency toward gadgets. But with these numbers, 121 times more Indonesians get online with uh, a very, very slow, high latency, low bandwidth connection. If we quickly aggregate this data, we'll find that three and a half meg is the average connection out of that region. Only one fifth of them are online at all. A mere 1.5% of that region have a broadband connection, 1.5%. A staggering 90% have cellular. The numbers here are absolutely just mind blowing. This is very, very different to what we're used to. I guess everyone here has got a Wi-Fi connection at home. Imagine living somewhere where it's 1.5% of you. We could uh, quickly look at England, where I'm from. We've got 15 meg average speeds. Pretty much every single person is online, 92%. 37.7% uh, have broadband, and 125% of us have a phone. So again, more than one device. What gets interesting is when we step into Poland and we find that the average speed is 13 meg, uh, two thirds of you are online, a fifth of you are on broadband, and uh, 1.5 times as many, or there are 1.5 uh, averages, uh, average devices each. Who's got more than one device? There we go, <laughs> right? So, oh, okay. But um, yeah, you find here that as soon as we compare east to west, we get very, very different statistics, very different numbers. So what does this tell us? It tells us that if we want to truly, truly build for an international market, we're looking at a completely different class of user. Uh, this guides business decisions. I mean, we might not actually need or want to sell in the East. But if we do, we have to make fundamental technological changes to how we build websites. We can't build with the assumption that someone's got a nice, fast Western connection. So when I work with clients, one of the first things I get asked is, uh, Harry, well, how fast should we be? How fast is fast enough? Um, the bad news is, I don't know. There's no answer to that question. I can't give you a number. 
Uh, you can run benchmarks against um, similar websites in, in the same industry. You could gather data over a certain period of time. You can see how things have, have changed that way. But this is normally quite expensive and quite time consuming. So my first bit of advice to anyone who wants to improve the speed of their website is just be faster than your nearest competitor. Speed is a competitive advantage. And if you don't know where to start, this is probably the safest bet. Just be faster than your nearest competitor. I found a really fascinating site recently. It's like a, a, a tool called Dareboost. Anyone heard of Dareboost? Yeah, not many people have. I found it. Um, basically, it allows you to run comparisons between your, uh, your site and a competitor's. Just side by side, run some, uh, run some audits and see what's going on. I'm comparing my site here to a site called CSS Tricks. Anyone heard of CSS Tricks? Cool. Um, now, I'm quite a lot faster than CSS Tricks, but what you have to remember is that they're two very different websites. My website's like a personal site with a bit of a blog. Chris's site is way more of a community, a little more complex. But this is a really good start, and you can start to benchmark yourself against competitors. Now, um, I've been chatting to the folk at Dareboost. They're a really nice company. And what they said they'd do is they'd give you all a discount code. So if you want to use, this is one you do have to take a picture of, because this isn't going in the slide deck. If you use this discount code, you will get 20% off every plan forever, I think, just for all durations. 20% um, off the Dareboost plans. Um, yeah, that one's not going to be in the slide deck when it gets published. So if you do want this discount code, take a picture. OK, another great tool. Something called Speed Curve. Anyone heard of Speed Curve? Brilliant. Right, oh, a few of us. Speed Curve is addictive. We'll look at it in more detail later. But Speed Curve allows you to run very, very detailed tests against your site and your competitors. What we can see here is that we've got a few new sites that we're comparing. And The Guardian and The New York Times are fighting out for very similar speeds. They're a very similar kind of level of performance. Whereas uh, The Huffington Post is markedly slower and a lot more erratic. If we look at a lot of the, uh, the data for Huffington Post, we're looking very, very erratic. We'll come back to this tool later, but now I want to talk about how we actually get there. How do we actually start making the changes to start building faster websites? I'm going to share three tips. And they're not like you know, BuzzFeed kind of three ways to have a fast website. These aren't small tips. These are fundamental ways of changing your workflow to start building fast websites. I've already lied to you as well, because there are actually four. Um, the zeroth tip is as simple as just, just want a fast website. The biggest change you could make when you start performance optimizing a website is actually try, right? actually care. Do not underestimate the importance of this step. This concerted effort from a team actually prioritizing and funding performance, making sure the entire team is pulling in the same direction, is going to make a massive change. Making fast websites isn't particularly easy, and it's not going to happen by accident. So a concerted effort actually trying to build a fast website, you will see you get really, really good results really quickly. So yeah, don't underestimate the importance of this step. It's our job as developers, I guess, to educate marketeers, product owners, clients, managers, that every decision they make will have a knock-on effect when it comes to performance. Performance is often left as being the DevOps team's job or the software engineer's job. But actually, performance starts the minute someone puts a single pixel in Photoshop. Or it makes, it, performance happens as soon as a product owner makes a decision to do a certain thing. Everybody is responsible for this, so it's our job as developers to start pushing that responsibility back further into the team. Okay, that was the zeroth step. The first step is understand the problem. But, I mean, really properly understand it. Test your website from different points of view. Don't assume that everyone is uh, kind of visiting your site in the same scenario as you are. Uh, being fast on a, a nice sort of shiny new MacBook Pro in a well-connected city on a fiber connection, being fast in, in that kind of scenario, that's not fast, right? That's not really fast. What is fast is being um, able to deliver a site quickly in the middle of a field on a 2G connection on a commodity Android device because that's what the internet really looks like. Facebook had a really nice idea a few years ago, 2G Tuesdays. Anybody here of 2G Tuesdays? Okay, well, so what Facebook did is they actually artificially throttled their website to 2G speeds one day a week. No points for guessing which day it was. And what that made them realize is, holy shit, this is really difficult to use our website. Our website is horrendous. If you try and visit Facebook on a 2G connection, 
it just takes forever. And it kind of trained them, it taught them as an entire company instantly that we need to do better. Our site is very hard to visit if we're trying to break into these emerging markets. Now, actually setting up something like this goes way above my pay grade. I, I guess it'd be like some IP fencing and uh, I don't know, something with your router config. I, I couldn't set this up. So what I do with clients is I just get them to install Charles Proxy. Anyone heard of Charles? Oh, wow, a very few people. So Charles Proxy is free, so Google it, get it. What Charles allows you to do is it allows you to th uh, throttle specific domains. So rather than making your entire internet connection slow using something like Network Link Conditioner, with Charles, you can start dropping in individual domains, individual endpoints. So you can slow down your site and its dependencies, Google Fonts, for example. Uh, it also allows you to simulate third-party outages. So what happens if your tag manager goes completely offline? Or what happens if um, your tag manager is experiencing uh, network delays? So Charles Proxy, it's an amazing tool, uh, very quick to get started with. Um, however, when we think about performance, we normally think about how fast a site loads, but it's not just connection speed anymore. I mean, how fast a site loads is important. Load times are very important metrics, but that's just the beginning of the problem. A lot of the problems actually only start after we've loaded the page. Um, who's got a phone that looks like this? This is an iPhone 7. Okay, maybe like, you know, 10% of us. Who's got like a, a relatively new, um, like Samsung device? Like we've all, like, we're, in, we're in tech, right? We've got good phones. Um, if you've got a phone like this, then perfect, good for you. That's amazing. Nice, fast device. However, this is not representative of the world at large. Most people aren't running shiny, new, fast devices. This is a Moto G4, Motorola Moto G4. It's the most representative phone to use for testing if you're going into emerging markets. Google's engineers recommend buying one of these as your test device uh, for for seeing how fast your website is. Uh, in fact, the reason they, the rep, uh, they recommend this is because the difference between this and an iPhone is staggering. We see that the processing speed is roughly half. This means that runtime, like JavaScript, or expensive animations, or, or really uh, sort of heavy images on screen, will start to make the actual browsing experience feel slow. It's no longer just about how fast the, pi uh, the page loads, it's about how quickly the page interacts. For the more data conscious among you, uh, Phone Arena does some way more sort of detailed benchmarking. And you can see that the iPhone at the top is about three to four times faster in nearly every single benchmark. So if you're testing on a phone or a top, uh, top, top, um, top end Android device, you're gonna get really misleading results. Everything's gonna feel about four times as quick for you. Uh, what you can do is you can start, th if you don't have one of these devices available, in DevTools, we should start using the, uh, the throttling in there. Anyone seen this before? Anyone seen this view? Yeah, I guess spot the front-end developers. You can simulate CPU slowdowns. So dividing your CPU by about five will give you a fairly good indication of how your site might run on a low-powered device. I guess we're all guilty of this, right? We build a responsive website, and the way we test it is by resizing Chrome. What you really want to do is test it on an actual device that's much smaller with a much lower CPU power. There is no replacement for real devices. Having real devices makes all the difference. Now, this is where I sound like a hypocrite and I tell you I don't actually have a Moto G4. Uh, I've actually got a worse phone. I've got a Nexus 5, which came out a few years before the, uh, the G4. Uh, and this is what I use as my testing device. This is what I use to test websites on. I'm doing uh, some work with a client at the moment, and they've got an M whatever, whatever website, m.website.com. And all of their engineers use nice, shiny MacBooks. They're in central London on wired connections, and they're building a mobile site on MacBook. It doesn't make any sense. I started profiling their website, and this, this screenshot isn't great because it wasn't ever meant to end up in a talk. It was actually for a report I was giving to this client. What I found that their main JavaScript bundle took 1.7, well, 1.8 seconds just to evaluate that script. So remember the other company I told you about? 0.3 seconds was worth 8 million to them. We spent nearly two seconds just parsing a JavaScript file here because I was on a low-powered CPU. Two whole seconds just to churning over one file. And this, the, the worst thing about this is this is divorced from network conditions. Even if I was on a super fast Wi-Fi connection, this still takes me two seconds because it's already on my phone, it's cached. The JavaScript is completely divorced from network conditions. So yeah, it's really important 
to build up an idea of realistic conditions. When I say realistic, I'm talking realistic network speeds. Realistic network conditions, high latency. Um, it might be an area where DNS just takes forever for whatever reason. There might be network uh, outages. There might be anything going wrong, but you're probably building in quite a nice bubble. You're an engineering company. You might even have your DNS managed by a dedicated provider, so you might even you know, circumvent kind of those problems. And also realistic processing power. Once we've worried about getting over the network, our next worry should be about how fast is the device that I'm actually building for. Okay, step two, know what's going on. This is probably the hardest one in the entire talk. Um, you need to build a really good picture of every single thing that's happening underneath the hood. This is difficult because you need to start calling meetings and speaking to people and talking to people you may have never spoken to before and just finding out exactly what your website is doing because most companies I work in are fairly siloed. You might have the front end dev team, you've got the marketing team completely, completely separate. The back-end developers don't talk to anyone, and the DevOps engineers are completely separate. And that's how most big companies work. You end up with a problem where you're looking at the live website, you're looking at the website in production, it's like, hang on, when did, when did this arrive? And it turns out the DevOps team are using New Relic, and the front-end developers didn't have any idea that was happening. And then it turns out, also, where are these tracking scripts coming from? It turns out your marketing department is dropping JavaScript everywhere. Has anybody, does anybody live in this world where you just look at your website, and it's like, who's what happened? I didn't do any of this. This is certainly my life, and understanding what's going on here is the key to making a fast. You cannot make a website faster if you do not know what it's doing. So this is the trickiest bit. Find out what's going on. Um, you know, there's um, other teams, other kind of departments have different sort of needs, different requirements. So they all start dropping tag managers in there. Um, you'll have people who are that horrible Schrodinger effect of we need to measure everything. Well, that's kind of making things slower. Hmm, yeah, the site is slow. Let's measure why it's slow. No, you're making it slower again. I, um, I, was, I don't think it's in the talk. This is a very, very new talk. I don't think it's in this one. Um, but I was dealing with a client the other day. They've got a, an A-B testing tool. And the A-B testing tool happens on the client, right? So it's just it's slow by default. So a JavaScript file goes over the wire. And a bit of embedded JavaScript in the HTML sets opacity zero on the entire body element. And then the JavaScript, the file that arrives afterwards, rearranges the page and does some client-side A-B testing. And that JavaScript file that arrives afterwards then takes opacity zero back off of the body and continues. That means that if the third party has an outage, it just stays, it stays opacity zero forever. It's actually opacity zero important as well. So this, this company are using an A-B testing tool to try and increase conversions. They're trying to optimize for more sales Yet the very tool they're using makes the website invisible for many seconds. The Schrodinger effect here is staggering. So yeah, call meetings, find out what everything is, who's using it. Hey, we've got this tool here, who uses that? And then go and find the person who uses it and ask them what they use it for. So okay, well this costs us 10,000 pounds a year for the license. We can build a replacement that will be much quicker because it's more customized. So we can save money there and we can actually reduce our overheads. Find out how you can help them. Join the dots between what they do and what your users experience. Is anybody familiar with tag managers, by the way? Anyone not know what a tag manager is? So a tag manager just allows a non-technical person to write JavaScript on your website. They're evil. It basically, when a marketing team comes to you and says, hey look, I need to measure X, Y, and Z, and a developer has to fire open their text editor, make the change, push it live, and that's quite an expensive cycle. So what a tag manager does is it allows the developer to put one bit of JavaScript on the site, and that JavaScript is a conduit for all the other JavaScript that the marketing person might want to add. So the marketing person gets a nice CMS kind of style UI, and they get to say, measure this, measure this, measure this, and all of a sudden your website is running thousands of JavaScript files that your developers have never even seen. I want to show you a screenshot. Um, this is from an amazing article by a company called Studio 107. This is from an article called um, Tags Gone Wild Managing Tag Managers. The green is the stuff that the user turned up for. The green is the website. The green is the thing that is probably making you money. The red is third-party tracking scripts, pixels, ad code. This is stuff the user does not care about at all. It's all the crap that we send to them. And this was caused by a tag manager. This was a simple third-party library 
that allowed people to just inject arbitrary bits of JavaScript into a page. This is what we need to understand because when you view source and you see all of this crap, you have no idea where it's coming from. You need to start making sort of meetings, t speaking to your, um, your marketing department and find out why this is happening because this is where things get slow. It's important to know your liabilities. Third parties can and will cripple you. In fact, most of the people I work with, their biggest performance bottlenecks are actually third parties. Most of the things that are slowing them down aren't really their fault. Um, this is another A-B testing tool, and it's, another, it's not the same one I was talking about before, but this is um, another client-side A-B testing tool. And um, what we can see here, I'm afraid this screenshot's terrible on this, on this, um, this projector, but we can find out that 98.1% of the runtime overhead was provided or caused by a third-party A-B testing tool. Nearly 100% of the runtime overhead on this web page was an A-B testing tool. Think of like the painful irony of that. An A-B testing tool to optimize your site makes it 100% slower. If anyone's interested in gathering this data, finding out who is your biggest bottleneck, open DevTools, go into the performance panel, run an audit, and then you want to go to performance bottom up and then group by domain. This is another really, really useful slide if you want to take a picture of this one. It is in the slide deck, it's online, but this is the quickest way to blame someone else, which is nice. It tells you which other domains are causing you the most problems. And then you can drill down into specific URLs so you can see that, okay, our CDN is the problem, but it's actually this JavaScript file from our CDN. So it is our fault, but it's this specific file. You can get really good drill downs. Now this client I was working with, I, it was actually my job to help them rebuild the site. We were replatforming, moving everything onto a new code base, and we made performance a first class citizen. That was part of my job. So what they did is they ripped out the A-B testing tool. They ripped it out, rebuilt the site, put it live, and things went amazingly well. In the first 24 hours, there was no marketing campaign, by the way. In the first 24 hours, purely organic traffic. Sales went up by, I think, 5%. Traffic went up by about 12%. Things were great. Things were so good that the marketing team said, we should start measuring this. Can you put the A-B testing tool back on there? What ended up happening is first paint went from under 0.8 seconds to over two seconds. We were painting the page in under a second, and just by putting this A-B testing tool back in there, we increased that to 2 point, I think 2.1. This is an email the client sent me. Again, the painful irony of this tool that's designed to make your website faster just made it over a second slower. And a second's worth a lot of money to an e-commerce company. I'm sure you've all heard the statistics that 53% uh, of users will abandon a site if it takes over three seconds to load. Well, we've just made it nearly three by putting an A-B testing tool in there. Uh, identifying third parties is a really important thing. When we're looking at that big screen full of mess, all those third party tracking scripts, all that stuff we're not used to, that, thing, that stuff we didn't put in there, it's really hard to reverse engineer where that stuff came from. But again, Chrome is doing amazing stuff to help us out with this. Uh, if you've got a copy of Chrome, you can play more of the blame game. Um, if you've got Chrome with dev tool experiments enabled, if anyone, wants to, if anyone wants to go through this during one of the breaks, come and find me, I'll show you exactly how to do it. But if you've got Chrome with DevTools experiments enabled, uh, in your settings, you'll find this thing called network request groups. And what network request groups will do is it will group network requests. There's no documentation for this stuff. In fact, here's another pro tip. When you get to this experiments view, hit shift six times, and even more stuff appears. Right? This is how well hidden it all is. Um, so what happens now is I was looking at a website. It was actually the BBC. And what I did is you, um, in your network panel, you right click and you turn on this product option. When you turn on the product option, you start to get loads of different information. It's really washed out on this screen, but what you should hopefully, what you should be able to see is this is yellow, some of these are blue, some of these are not colored in at all. Um, something here took over 35 seconds to do a TCP connection. You can see that big orange bar? 35 second TCP connection which is directly linked to our load event. Our load event didn't fire until after we'd got through this, this bottleneck. So there's some third-party script here is causing a 35-second delay on our web page. Um, sure enough, uh, because I've turned on this product panel, I can see that it's a product called the Rubicon Project. Oh, sorry, uh, a Rubicon Project. Just Googling that tells me this is an advert. This is an ad script. So we can now see that the Rubicon project ad script had some severe kind of uh, congestion. We can raise a support ticket. We could maybe go and find another advertising network. We could do anything here. But at least now we know exactly where the bottleneck is from because dev tools are actually starting to present this information to us in a really clear and digestible way. Uh, 
um, we often call things assets, right? We say, oh, can you send me the assets for the website? We shouldn't call them assets. We should, we should absolutely start calling them liabilities, especially if they're on a different domain. Third parties, external dependencies can and will cripple us. They, they leave us very, very vulnerable. Um, I'm doing some consultancy for a company called Sky back in the UK, and they've got a tag manager, Adobe Tag Manager, and um, the actual JavaScript itself is tiny. A bit of JavaScript's very, 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 very small indeed. But if for whatever reason, Adobe Tag Manager has an outage if they go offline, this render blocking script tag holds up the entire page. It means that the page doesn't load for 1.3 minutes. Their Tag Manager, a tiny bit of JavaScript designed to inject more JavaScript into a page, will take them offline for 1.3 minutes if there's an outage. What the browser does is it hangs for one point, well, 78 seconds. It will try and find this JavaScript file, and it will block rendering, it will block DOM construction, it will block other downloads, and after 78 seconds, Chrome decides to time out and then continue rendering the page. All because of one tiny JavaScript file the user doesn't care about. Again, third parties will completely cripple us. If anybody wants to simulate a third party outage, because I'm guessing who uses Google Fonts on one of their websites? Same happens, right? If Google Fonts goes offline, you go offline for 1.3 minutes before Chrome will time out. If you want to stress test this, if you want to like, you know, see how vulnerable you are, uh, add this to your hosts file. Web page test, anyone used web page test before? If you haven't used web page test, start using it immediately. It's the best performance measuring tool I've ever used. They've got a publicly available black hole server, which is available at this IP address. And what happens is any traffic that gets routed through this IP address, through this server, it just disappears. It goes into like a black hole. So you can route third-party dependencies through this, through this IP address to simulate full-on outages, and that's how I found out that Sky, or, or indeed anybody using the Adobe Tag Manager tool, or actually anybody using a render-blocking third-party script, uh, this is how you can find out. This is how you can stress test that stuff. So don't prioritize your own metrics over your users' experiences. Your marketing, your marketing team's voyeurism, I guess, is less important than your users' experiences. It's because the users are the ones who are paying your bills anyway. The users are the people who are keeping the lights on. Okay, last section. Uh, measure everything, absolutely everything. Measuring everything tells us two very important things. It tells us what is wrong in the first place, what is actually a problem, and secondly, it will tell us when we know we're getting things right. Always measure the before and always measure the after because then you know if you're headed in the right direction. I've worked in many teams where people have implemented what they thought were performance best practices that actually made things slower. If we didn't have the before and after to compare it to, we would have assumed we'd done the right job when we hadn't. Who's got analytics on their website? Oh, nearly everyone. Who hasn't logged into analytics for about six months? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, me as well, except yesterday for some stuff for this talk. If you've got analytics, the good news is this has been running performance metrics since forever. You've got a lot of historical data in analytics already. Um, if you go into behavior, site speed, page timings, you begin to uncover a treasure trove of different information. You can start to explore um, geographically what might be a problem, what might be problem areas. Um, so you can see Northern Europe, really, really fast. Some problem areas in Africa. Um, this is how I discovered that Nepal was a problem area for me, because it was a great big splodge of dark blue on the map, and it said Nepal, average load time, 200 and something seconds. So we can start beginning, uh, we can begin to explore things geographically. This GIF is so big that it hangs my machine for a while, so I take a strategic sip of water, there we go. What we can see here is, um, which pages in which markets. So we can actually start to do cross sections. When you're tasked with making a website faster, 90% of people just think, oh, I'll make the homepage faster. The homepage might be the fastest page on your site. Maybe it's a specific, a specific article that is your problem. 800% slower, this article in India. So my bottleneck isn't the homepage. It's getting a test server in India set up, really easy to do with web page test, profiling this page, seeing what it is about this page that's different to the rest. This tells us where to start. Um, then you can just group it literally by country, which tells me um, something interesting here, Brazil. We haven't talked about Brazil because, um, well, it's not in the East. But Brazil is also an emerging economy. Did you know that 
In order to afford a 500 megabyte data plan, a Brazilian has to do 8.6 hours of work. To buy a 500 meg data plan, a full day's work in Brazil, that's how much it costs. Now I thought, I want something to compare this to. My roaming, so right now I've got a roaming SIM card. Um, it's a, sp a specific contract that I only use abroad and I'm capped to 3G speeds, which is still pretty good. Um, but in the last 18 months, only when traveling, I used nearly 15 gig of data. For a Brazilian person to afford 15 gig of data, that's one month's work. Imagine working for one month out of your entire year just to afford 15 gigs worth of data. Super expensive. So this is what I mean about the moral side of performance. Sending two meg web pages is immoral, right? Because it could be costing someone the price of a coffee. Anyone heard of speed curve? Oh, we did this, we did this, speed curve, right? So I identified this problem in Brazil. I saw my site was slow in Brazil. So there's my before. Then I decided to set up some caching rules. I got my site on a CDN, so I decided to set up some more aggressive caching rules. And um, I ran some tests, started, started profiling my site from Brazil. And sure enough, what I did worked. Managed to reduce render time significantly. This would be impossible if we didn't have the before and after. Speed Curve is another incredible tool to run continuous benchmarks across your site and store the historical data. Uh, yeah, Speed Curve, completely addictive. It's easily my favorite kind of uh, paid for service. It's, it's worth every single penny. You can run tests from as little as one cent each. So even if you do like 20,000 tests, it's like $200 a month. So it's really, really affordable. Um, what I like about Speed Curve is this is a perfect graph to show a non-technical stakeholder. Telling your stakeholders that, oh, we managed to reduce latency by X amount, they don't really care about that. They don't care about latency. What they care about is graphs. Right? And we can see here we're clearly making good progress here. We've done something good here that should warrant more funding or research into performance. And from this, we can set up budgets. What I find, though, is that most people hate the word budget, so it's just kind of um, just monitoring with a purpose, right? Monitoring with a view to keeping things kind of within budget. Now, what this allows us to do is run alerts and tell us, hey, look, this has got particularly bad, this has got particularly bad. Um, for my site, I've got my site set up on speed curve. My site's actually really basic. It's a very simple website. Um, it's got the mandatory big hero image that every website has to have in 2017. Um, it's got a few external dependencies. It's got, an advert, uh, it's got an advert on the side, Twitter widgets. It's fairly typical. Now, what speed curve tells me, as well as analytics, is that there is a massive divide across the globe. You visit my site from Ireland, it's nice and fast. Start, it starts rendering within 1.3 seconds, pretty quick. Um, it means I've got 0.72 seconds of my budget left to play with. I'm actually well within my three second limit here. Um, it's visually complete in 1.3 seconds as well. Uh, I've set myself a target to be visually complete within three seconds and well under the, mar uh, well under the uh, budget here, doing really well. This isn't me showing off, by the way, what I'm trying to say is this is an island. Ireland's a very well connected city. As soon as I go to Brazil, I'm still over budget every now and again. The exact same website, the exact same infrastructure, all static HTML, it's the exact same code, there is nothing different about my website between Brazil and Ireland. But just visiting from Brazil, every couple of days I go over budget, sometimes by a lot, sometimes by not so much, but just being geographically in a different place makes a big difference. Uh, it's still a whole second slower than Ireland. Remember that 0.3 seconds is worth eight mil to a certain company, I'm a whole second slower just by being visited from a different country. Uh, the last thing I want to go through then is um, to make things really interesting, what happens if we're on the worst possible connection imaginable? In Speed Curve, you can set up custom profiles. Here we've got um, half a second of artificial latency, uh, 150 kilobyte download speeds, and then 10% of all the packets, I'm just telling those to go, go missing, right? And packet loss on a mobile network is really good. When you're pinging somewhere from a hotel, it's like most of your packets go missing. That has huge ramifications for performance. Anyone know about TCP slow start? Oh, a lot of nods, cool. For those who don't know about TCP slow start, every time, every time a packet goes missing, your connection resets itself to the lowest possible throughput and then scales up again. Packet goes missing, go right back to the bottom, head of line blocking. So packet loss is a huge, huge performance killer and it's very prevalent in mobile networks. As soon as I set up a really, really stressful environment, very bad Wi-Fi, or very bad network I called it, this is what things look like. This is what things really look like. 
I'm completely over budget every single day. I'm over budget by six and a half seconds. My site is very heavily optimized. Imagine a site that isn't. Imagine a site that someone hasn't tried to be fast. That might say 66 seconds. So this is really important to keep an eye on. And one thing this taught me as well is that even your, arti sorry, even your um, normal testing tools, they're artificial. They're fairly consistent. The bottom line shows me that nearly every day my site is the same, but as soon as I introduce a realistic mobile network, there is no guarantee that I'm gonna get any consistency. So I've gone a couple of seconds over, so just to close, um, those three things again, so just care. Actually start prioritizing performance. Actually start trying to be fast. Make sure your client, your team, your designers, your marketeers, your backend developers, your DevOps team, make sure everyone's actually making an attempt at this. Uh, understand your customers, understand their problems, understand the network, understand the mobile landscape. Uh, you may not need to sell anything in the East. That may be a complete separate business decision divorced from the technological ones, that's fine and measure everything. Uh, the statistics and data were from uh, friends of mine, Tim and, <laughs> Tim and Tam. Uh, they built the WPO stats website and others. Um, and the last thing I wanna do is just say thank you for listening. Thank you for your time.